All right, people recording. So Tuesday, November 7, 2017 meeting. Let me share my screen here. Uh, who can take notes here today? Out of... I can do it. Josh? Yeah. Okay. Please do. And let's get going. So, main agenda for today is so look at the spike uh, basically on the n numbers on page one here. Let me share my screen for everybody. Uh, share right there. Uh, look at the spike on uh, last week. That was that's the workshop from last week. That was pretty uh, noticeable here. So a few things today. So one one thing is I took a bunch of pictures for the micro track, and I, I just did that right now. So I'm gonna post that up here uh, so people can document that. That's item number one. Um, one little update from Saudi Arabia. Uh, look at page four. So so they I mean we're still slowly but surely getting that printer built there for a potential workshop. So that's just a little recent <clears throat> recent shot we got. Uh, let's see. Let's talk about uh, Roberto first. Did did your printer arrive yet in Chile by any chance? Yeah, yeah. I, today I I I, go, I went to the post office. Yeah. And is and, and now I I have the printer in my home in my house. Excellent. Did you open it up yet, or? Yeah, yeah. I start to see. Started. Well, in yeah. Okay. So yeah, we definitely want to coordinate. So there's um, on a 3D printer. Um, yeah, I mean that's that's still a a ready workshop workshop ready kind of experience that we have in in a sense that that's a workshop we can run right now pretty replicably. But there is a few few steps to evolve on that. So as far as organizing everybody around that, there's yourself, there's myself here. There's the Saudi team, and also, um, who do we have on our team? Steven, who's building, I think he's looking at building a plastic frame version of that, of the printer. But, but the idea is getting that to, yeah, j just working out some of the final, final details. Like, like we want to definitely upgrade the, the extruder and make it a functional machine like we were aiming to potentially even do the you know print out rubber tracks for the tractor that hasn't happened but we're still hot on the progress of that uh, of the 3d printer including the filament maker filament maker also being with the collaboration from tech for trade the african people who have developed the pet filament maker and here we have the unfinished unfinished filament maker for for ABS so the 3d printer is definitely I mean 3d printing is big it will be for some time so we want to make sure that we do the due diligence to to make it happen as we do some of the other projects there's a couple of people that are applying for the team right now that are uh, getting on board so that we're gonna add a few more people uh, hopefully in the next week or so um, but we want to be kind of strategic how we divide the effort between all of us so so we're moving forward wrapping up past work and and moving forward but a lot of it right now is wrapping up a lot of past work like the tractor the 3d printer uh torch table and getting ready like the big thing that's on my mind for next year is by by september i'm gonna see if we can put together our first immersion program where we're actually recruiting actively for people to join that program with explicit intent of replicating our our work and, and doing that as enterprise so um that's kind of like the big next step once again to address the idea that it's about at the end of the day people have to do that for a living uh, as opposed to as a hobby as far as doing the osc development work let's see who do we need to mute back there um i think josh gonna mute yourself or okay i think that went away um okay Sounds good. So let's let's maybe hear back a little bit. So so Lex, do you want to just go through? So one is the documentation platform, which is ShopAid, and then uh, OSC Dev Workbench. Lex, you want to take it away for a little bit? Okay. Uh, I guess I'll start with the uh, Dev Workbench. Mm -hmm. um, so I've made a lot of progress on it. Um, 
Uh, I know I've, I, so the thing I've started with is this chat feature, even though that's not really you know a critical thing, but it's it's something that uh, if you can do chat, then you can do anything else. You know, uh, it's also pretty straightforward. So uh, this would be embedded. Hold on a second. Would this be embedded? Like how how do we do it? Like. Well, if you look in the screenshot, so if you go to the uh, slide five, yeah, uh, you can see that's actually just FreeCAD running, and that's both yeah. uh, 16 and 17 are working. Uh, and it's a, a workbench that when you enable the workbench, there's two buttons right now, or three buttons. There's a connect, disconnect, and then there's a little um, uh, chat icon bu button. So that, that actually enables and disables the chat at the bottom. Uh, and basically, when you connect, it creates a connection uh, and then keeps it open to OSC Dev. And then you can use it for chat, and then the next step would be to add the uh, product lifecycle management stuff. So you can download and upload and version uh, and files and search for files and parts and do all that stuff. So we're uh, talking about within FreeCAD, uh, adding chat chat ability within FreeCAD, essentially? It's, uh, yeah, it's our, this is already working. Actually, I can show a demo. I have it. Why don't uh, you do that? We have two FreeCADs open. Uh-huh. Uh, let me share, Sh share your screen. Oh, wait, oh, it says I have to add an extension. Well, that's pretty cool. I mean, to get, you know, chat working within FreeCAD, that's pretty cool. Oh, wait, actually, it's working, I guess. Am I, can you guys see my screen? Yeah. Okay, uh, let's see if I switch to uh, FreeCAD. Can you guys see both FreeCADs? No, it's, for me, it kind of, i got a poor connection, no. so I'm going to cross can out anybody my... Else see? Yeah, I can see the two chat windows, yeah. Okay, so if I type, so I've got one free cat open, logged in as Lex, and the other one logged in as a user called Test, and uh, if I type, you know, hello in one, it shows up here, and then you can see it here, and then here if I type in stuff, it you know, shows up in both. So this is actually, it's going round tripping, it's going to OSC Dev, it's getting logged there, and huh. then it comes back. Uh, and I can show you right here, so right now, 22 messages because I just typed huh. something, right? If I type something here, hit enter and I reload. So there's 20, 23 messages now. And I can create uh, a new chat room. So let's do a D3D chat room, right? Let's hmm. save. Oh, I got a tip of description. We got a description. Uh, now, it doesn't automatically update right now, but it will eventually. So you got to disconnect and then uh, reconnect. And there it is. It's right there. Huh. And I can join this. So I'm double clicking joins it. And I, if I refresh, you can see here D3D participants one, messages zero. So um, I get a log out. Uh, so now if I go here and I type in who and I hit reload, you can see one message, one participant. Huh. And then if I'm fine here, I get a log out and log back in. But anyway, so yeah, so this is yeah, the, the, the way I've, I've done this is that it's using. Um, uh, it's multiplexing different streams. So within FreeCAD, every kind of app that we'll do, so the chat and then the PLM and anything else we have, like time tracking or whatever, uh, they can be sort of independent modules. And then they use the same connection to OSC Dev. And then on OSC Dev, they're also separate modules. So think of it as like three applications on the server and on the client, but they're using the same link to connect and, commu and communicate. Uh, so that was that's part of like a lot of what took effort and time to uh, get things going. So then it'll be easy for other people to add plugins that communicate between client and server and, and um, let us huh. do different plugins and things. Well, that's pretty so nice. It's coming along. Yeah. yeah. That's pretty interesting. So can you um, can you maybe send an email to everybody? So can we actually start using this now? Or uh, No. Not yet? Uh, it's still, it's still, still a lot of things missing. For example, on the right-hand side, there's a blank panel here. That's supposed to have the list of users that are participating. Uh huh. Um, and then uh, it's not it's not very clear how to join because you have to double click to join, and then so there's some things okay. that aren't clear. So, uh, but other you... than that, yeah, I mean it's, it's very close. Okay. So so are you saying that in an OSC dev, like we could be having chat in there, and then in another window we could be doing, I mean, what what do you see as the workflow? Chat in one window and and a gra and a, the model in another, the CAD it's model. The same window. It's in FreeCAD, so it's already here. Let me. Uh, uh, so, so one of the windows within FreeCAD, but, but if you're doing the OSC Dev Workbench, you have to have typically the. Oh no, you can change it. Okay, so can okay. you see my screen now? Here, I'll yeah, now we can. Part design. Yeah. I'm in part design, but it's still down here. Okay. Okay. 
cool. It doesn't. What I did was instead of using the normal, I kind of bypassed the normal workbench stuff to add the chat room, and you can uh, you can close it like this. In yeah. order to open it back up, you do huh. have to switch to the uh, OT dev workbench, and then you click here and it opens it back up. But once it's open, you can switch to any other workbench and do whatever you're doing. Nice. Uh, so the cool thing we can also add is sharing the view you see, right? So we can make it super easy to like share what I'm currently looking at. Uh, so like you could be, you can have a question about design. You can like click, you know, share, and it'll show it up in chat, or even just you know have a, a new tab open with what the other person is looking at, and then type in your question and stuff. Uh, oh wow! So I mean, so really getting close to cloud collaborative CAD in some way, right? Yeah, yeah, that's 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 the whole point of the workbench is to collaborate, right. to do collaborative uh, stuff. Yeah. Nice. And then the other nice thing is what I plan to do for the chat rooms is it'll be a separate room for each uh, sort of product or module. And then uh, as you're working on it, you can be talking about it. And so we have sort of a, a record of, of the discussion that goes with the part. You know, like right now, it's kind of hard to uh, so to kind of find all of the things that are related to uh -huh. um, a single product. So here, we'll just have a separate chat room for each one. And then if you communicate in, in that chat room when working on the part, then it kind of all stays together. Uh, and there's one more really cool thing. So. Uh, this is in FreeCAD, but I'm actually using WebSockets. So doing a web-based client, so we can have like another chat room on a website that you don't have to have FreeCAD to use. Uh, that uh -huh. should be really easy to do because it's just it's just plain old uh, WebSockets. So uh, so we'll have that as well. You'll be able to. So somebody who's not uh, a FreeCAD developer, but like HR, for example, they want to participate in the chat. They'll be able to do that by just going to the site, and you know it'll just work. And then, okay, so if we can do this kind of screen sharing, um, doesn't the next logical progression of this whole sequence here imply that we can then basically, like, you're, you're working in a model, and then I take it, like, okay, now it's my own, and I can update it, and therefore we have effectively achieved Cloud CAD? Yeah, that's what, so the, that's what the, the PLM module is going to do that, where you lock uh -huh. and unlock, and then you can... Um, well, the, the, only, the only difference is the files are pretty big. I mean, it's five megs, so, you know, for, uh, like, a, the microtrack uh, mm -hmm. master file. So you can't exactly, we can't sync them very quickly. Mm -hmm. So you can you can lock and unlock, but every time you save, you got to download and, and share. So you can share a video stream, right, but then you can't edit it. So you can watch somebody else working, but you can't mm -hmm. also participate. So that part isn't going to be something that we can solve easily. Well, I mean... But we can get close. Well, but, but that's where we go back to our protocols of the file simplification where we get uh, non-detailed non parts that are small size but, but very accurate in the model. So we go back to that, you know, from the 5 meg we take it to say 500k by simplifying all the parts like we've been doing before to still get meaningful meaningful design. It just means, yeah, proper... Pro yeah, proper understanding by team members of how to do that i i think that's t totally tractable so yeah well no. we can we can once we get the basic stuff we can do it iteratively you know we don't have to like right you know, let's get just the people oh, yeah. with the locking and unlocking going and then once that works oh we yeah can sort of take a step back and think of how far we've made it and then, and then kind of iterate from there and see but yeah i mean wow. the, the eventual goal is to make it easier to to collaborate so yeah 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 no this is uh I mean, we had the discussion a long time ago that, oh, to make FreeCAD into a cloud collaborative platform is impossible. We're, I mean, we're just doing it right here. Yeah. So this is good. Good job. And I like this too because it's not dependent on you having like an internet connection. If, you, if your internet goes down, you can still just work on FreeCAD. Oh, cool, yeah. Okay. No, that's, that's really good. That's awesome. The, the modularity in that aspect, yeah, you don't collapse the system. You still have the file. Yeah. Excellent. Because that's why like, if you've used a Chromebook or something, it's just kind of annoying because if you don't have internet, you can't do anything. Mm-hmm. Okay. Nice. Well, that's awesome, Lex. So let's let's continue. So tell us, uh, so is that it on that topic? Or so when do you see... Uh... Yeah, I, I think, I think okay. so. The next step is just once I get the chat stuff kind of wrapped up and pushed out and we start using that, then... The next step will be the uh, product lifecycle management. So nice. uh, downloading and uploading CAD files and basically all the stuff that's described in the wiki page. Uh, uh, which which is the wiki page? So that page you just linked right there, OC Dev Workbench? Yeah. yeah. And I guess one other thing I'll add is that uh, yesterday I got Oliver set up. Oliver has a working version of his local computer of OC Dev 
and OSC Dev Workbench, and he's able to. So what I showed replicating where I talk one freak out to another. So he has this also uh -huh. replicated locally. So so he can theoretically also you know help develop stuff. Wow. Uh, it, it, it took some took some time to get everything worked out, so we'll, we'll definitely have to document it and stuff. Uh huh. But um, okay. So that is just I excellent, man. Side, I, can move, I can move on to uh, shop aid. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. So for shop aid, the idea here is is just to do um uh well to do the video instructionals recording. Okay, session. hold on a sec, Lex. Lex, hold on a second. Since we're recording this yeah. and other people are watching this, we got it. Whenever we start talking, let's give perspective. So the perspective is. We've got a. We talked about during the workshop, last workshop on the tractor build, we talked about the necessity of an easy system to document everyone's progress using a little video setup that you can pretty much hit stop and start so that we're actually catching real builds. And there's multiple stations. So these are documentation stations where you just basically have a Raspberry Pi with a camera. And we have multiple of these. So we actually catch real build video as opposed to because typically what happens right now is somebody might have a time lapse here time lapse there and it's so far been it's decent it's nice time lapses and nice videos and nice pictures but what we're failing to capture is the actual thorough procedure of one project like or one part of the project one part of the build being taken from zero to finish and this this i think would address a lot of that i mean in addition to doing the other stuff but here you can have one of these documentation stations next to your work table and you can complete that documentation gap of, of catching some part from zero to finish. Okay, so go ahead. Yeah, so the, the idea is to start with that because that's something that, you know, we don't have to reinvent anything there. We can, uh, I mean, building, so like, can you see the, my screen right now with yeah. the picture of the, uh, basically an office chair type of uh, roller at the bottom and yeah. a big stick on it and then, all we do is attach a Raspberry Pi and a camera to it and, yeah. you know, and a screen. So, so that's something that's like relatively straightforward that we can do. And then once we have that, then the next step we can, you know, once we have it developed and uh, and working, we can start adding more automation and, and you know, add a couple of arms and then mm -hmm. uh, make it drive around on its own. So I'm just thinking that this is a good way where we can have incremental improvement yeah. or incre add features incrementally and always have something that's useful. Um, you know, and working and and the idea here is that if we do the shop aid you know as a robot uh, not everyone needs a, a a shop but but there's a lot more people who might be interested in contributing if they can do some house chores so i was thinking that um we can sort of parallel both of them and kind of because there's a lot of reuse of, of logic like moving around and you know all these things. so um, this way we can uh, throw a bigger net as far as as getting people interested so mm -hmm. So, so this is in the research stage. I don't have any any code yet. This is just kind of um, planning it out and figuring out what the steps are to get uh, deliverables, you know, in small increments. Yeah, yeah. And I would say the phase one is okay. Let's show this cool documentation system. Show that very minimal product, which is as we described the the keyboard or, or just the button, camera, Raspberry Pi. Um, and then show that actually I mean it would be good if if you know by the next workshop when's the next workshop right now it's March of next year but if we could do that for next workshop that would be good just to test the basic platform is it working well like just basically developing a an open source Raspberry Pi camera system dedicated to documentation I mean that I don't know what's the state of art and have you looked at what um, the state of Raspberry Pi cameras is there's a, a module you can get from from Raspberry that's specifically a camera for, uh, and it's a you know a high definition camera. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so that's yeah, that's definitely. I was thinking of we could do a, a 3D printed enclosure and then put both the Raspberry and the camera in there, and then put a battery, you know, a 12 volt battery at the bottom, right. and power everything, and then also the monitor. Yeah. Uh, so if you yeah if you go to the wiki page for this, I have uh, basically a breakdown of a, a theoretical bomb. Uh, of, of what what it would take um, right to get everything and together, so. in your initial thoughts on this have you considered the idea of how do you make the the workflow easy like right now for example I use a lot of uh, Google Drive can this easily be made to upload to Google Drive like say automatically like say we have well one of the issues we have at the workshop is there's no internet yeah so and guess, assuming assuming we right? get internet in there yeah uh, 
yeah, if there's internet there, we can we can have it upload. Um, I, I'm thinking though, we might. I, I don't know how you want the workflow. I mean, that depends on how you want the workflow to be. But um, it might be better to have it locally first, and then have somebody go through it before it gets uploaded, because it might be a lot of stuff generated, a lot of video. Yeah, uh, but and that's know. right. Yeah, and that's the part we have to be smart about because we don't want to get, of course, glutted with pictures that we can't use. Yeah, so. So I think the design of the workflow would be an important aspect um, in this. There's one side is the technology, but the second part is what's our upload workflow and processing workflow. Because this I can see integrate with OSE edit. I don't know if you know that page on the wiki. Let me just uh, send it to you. OSE DIT. Those been initial ideas. Let me see. Of what cloud collaborative video editing looks like. Um, so that's one of those things we've seen that we can do real-time video documentation and the instructionals production that was one of the things we have shown uh, let me just share that link with you guys just so you keep that in mind that we do want to consider okay now if we have this are there ways we can upload it and invite a remote team to collaborate given that we now have good documentation within the workshop that doesn't take a dedicated person it actually people can manage their little little uh, shop aid stations themselves and if that's highly automated we don't necessarily need a dedicated video person and that that stuff can be coming up into the internet uh, getting uploaded and then a remote team could do most of the management so so some kind of a workflow where we really crack this remote documentation bit that's what I could see as the promise of this this here. So I, I like the general direction we're going. So look at the link yeah, in the one, chat one box. Com one yeah. comment I'll add to that is um, what, almost everyone brought a laptop with yeah. them, but nobody, but people didn't want to, you know, risk bringing the laptop into the workshop. So I think right. one workflow is that you, you know, you get your uh, your recording station and you bring it to your, you know, work area. You make a video, and then when you go back to the Hab Lab, you can just pull up what you've made, the recording is you made, and you can use your own personal laptop or, or you know, one provided there uh, to actually edit it and do anything else before uploading it online. So I think that's one other workflow. Um, right. So, so you'd, you'd use the devices in the workshop to do the recording, but then you'd go back to the Hab Lab to do the actual right. editing. Right, and we also know that most people are not going to be doing it there, like except one person like Scott who keeps on popping up those... Um, you know the time lapses but most people there are chilling and talking to one another so there's we don't expect a lot of that to be done during the workshop that's why I'm I'm invoking the remote team they could okay. really be critical to that because as you know I mean we want to be talking to each other and and discussing things and troubleshooting and doing other things when we're there not just sitting on ourselves by ourselves editing which is something we can do by ourselves well, you know? then it, then it yeah, then it comes down to your your internet pipe. I mean, you, you have to get something fast enough where people can uh, external collaborators can view the the videos on the hard drive that's local. I mean, we can set it up so the only bottleneck is going to be your internet connection. Yeah, yeah, definitely, and that, and that we have to think carefully about it because the internet here, the two options are a landline, which is just four meg, which is not good, and then there's things like HughesNet satellite, which is twenty five meg that's download and upload is maybe a few mag so yeah so we've got real limits here so we have to be strategic about how we address those issues I mean definitely pictures could be easy to do but if you talk about video we'd have to consider the compression and things pretty uh, DSL multi one does FEF have multi one DSL uh, we've got yeah I mean we've got DSL but it's not it's not fast it's four meg we've got we can get a couple of those four meg lines in here but yeah it's just not that fast but four meg itself would be good if, if we just smart about how you know even a single four meg connection you can upload a you can stream small video with that I mean just like I'm doing right now to do the hangouts and all that do the Jitsi what I thought was that you had uh, multiple DSL connections and that it was all bonded into one channel. Well, or, not, you may have had that at one time. They're not really bonded into one channel. It's it's multiple. Just just we had 
um, one in Hab Lab, one in a workshop, and we can get those up and running. We just have to just decide on a program for doing that. Because because the thing was like with the regular workshops, we didn't want to like you know have the internet on just for like this one weekend and the rest of the time it's not you know not being used so but yeah we, we have the capacity to get in up to like three lines available but we have to be routing stuff you know we have to basically set up repeaters or whatever like really upgrade our internet inf infrastructure because the hab lab line you can't run in a workshop another house line you can't run in a workshop so but if we should beam the signal over and have repeaters and stuff like that we kind of could use a whole strategy for how to do that here. Okay, so. I guess that's changed a few times. I thought I'd read on the wiki that there was, they installed some wireless routers because those open source routers are all capable of being programmed to like bond the channels and it's complicated, but there, there should be people that know how to, you can figure out how to do that stuff. It's not, a lot of those Linux routers have a lot of that built in. Yeah, um, I mean, it was kind of a, the, what we've had uh, prior, I mean, it was kind of ad hoc. Like, for example, like we might have had a wireless connection. Sometimes it might have been not reliable. And then, like, the line, we ran actually a physical cord from the Hab Lab into the workshop as well, which then people drove over that and broke it and, you know, stuff like that. So it's not a stable system. We just got to get it all nice and tidied up. So, so oh, but we can't do okay. that. Okay, so it's. 300 feet, I think is so is the limit yeah. on the cable, but yeah, I guess it just sounds like you need that trench to work in for that aspect. Yeah, I mean that or, or wireless, um, I mean, um, or just yeah. beaming connect connections through repeaters. Like at a university yeah. campus, well, you've got internet everywhere. I mean, that's the kind of solution we'd want to have. You have a yeah. beamer that set that takes care of the whole campus. Yeah, I, I got a newer one on the farm here and it it covers a huge area of the the farm here yeah um, yeah it's a newer one yeah maybe is, maybe uh email you, you can use patch, patch yeah email antennas yeah and it's the smaller one sometimes better wireless mm -hmm. is pretty reasonable right right so yeah maybe if you can email me what you got there i can take a look at that but yeah we really want to figure it out i mean ideally you have okay so you got these um say a couple of lines say the hab lab line and from that that you're beaming so you get it in the workshop and then so essentially like if we could get something with a 500 foot range that's wireless i mean that would be that would pretty much nail the need so that because because see everybody goes to the workshop and away from the hab lab when when we go to the workshop so the the hab lab line is completely unused so we could be sharing that to the workshop, you know, so things like that. So, guess, yeah, uh, the other thing is we don't have to have the documenters uh, working on the documentation at the exact same time. So we can have the, the videos made and then just upload, this, you know, if you have the two DSL lines, just use one of them for uploading videos. And, you know, however long it takes is how long it takes. And once yeah. they're all uploaded, then you can unleash the, you know, the external developer team to go through all the videos. Right. Um, and the cool thing about the real-time stuff is that you would have a, a connection where people can get feedback on it and, and socially you motivate them to participate because they're, they feel like they're part of, the, part of the build as opposed to they just get a dump in their lap and go into a corner by themselves. So there's a social element involved with it as well that we could try to see how we can optimize that. But we haven't well, really... If we can get a fast enough connection, then yeah. Yeah. But even, I mean, managed properly, you know, like, a, you know, what I'm doing right now, that's a single good connection. You know, we can have possibly one or two people. Um, yeah, I mean, we just, it, it just calls for an organized strategy for how to do this. We, we just got to nail it. I mean, even a single four meg line could do wonders if used properly. But, but the thing that happens is everyone gets on it, it bogs down and nobody has it. You know, that's, that's without management. So you got to, we got to just set it up properly. You know, things like that. So, but anyway, let's um, let's put that in the back of our mind. But definitely for the next workshop, I mean, I'd like to have shop aid for one and internet there. And when we do have internet, some protocol where everybody doesn't bog it down. You know, so how do we how do we do that? How do you set up the router 
I mean, maybe maybe we could start a working document on this. Like, how do you how do you set up your protocols, set up your your settings, so that, I mean, either you say, oh, people turn off your internets, or like we, you know, we shift, you know, people shift on the internet usage or something. I mean, however we got to do it, um, but just make the protocol clear. So that when we do have internet, it, it doesn't go down because everyone wants to use it, you know. Um, and that could also be like I know a lot of people when they when they come there, they they have their own wireless hotspots through three, four G or whatever, uh, through their phones too. So so I mean, there's a lot of internet present during a build. We just got to get a strategy for how how to use it all together, and make it most effective. So yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, continuing. Let's see. Uh, well, yeah, yep. I mean, that's, I, guess, I guess that's pretty much. So, uh, uh, if somebody is interested in, in, in working on this, uh, also, uh, you know, this is there's there's room available for more people on it. Yeah, yeah, there's room available for many many things here. So, um, let's take a look at. So, what I want to do right now is spend the rest of the meeting just going through the, because because the tractor documentation is one of the big things. There's one guy who's currently applying who wants to join the tractor team but uh, I'm gonna share my screen here since I didn't upload these yet but um, let me let me uh, share my screen I'm recording this for anyone that misses this but let's take a look at all the dimensions uh, all the relevant dimensions on the the micro track that are different than so the CAD is the pre-build CAD and since the build you want to just make sure that we've got all the uh, updated information on what we changed and so forth. So I'm going to go through about 75 pictures here and talk to you about all the dimensions. So, um, all right. Let's see. And, okay. So let's, if you guys are looking at my screen here. Let's just go through that, meaning all the changes that were made. Okay, so here's a picture of the bucket, four and a half inches. So that bar on top of the bucket is four and a half inches. I'm not sure if we changed that or not. Um, so the the quick attach plate sticks out from the bucket by about like one and a half inches. So we didn't cut off the quick attach plate uh, since we said, okay, I just leave it. Uh, so that's how it is right now hanging off one and a half inches off the bucket that's the side you no know, top of the bucket here's the uh, what is what are we showing here okay this is some of the critical dimensions of the the motor and what I'm showing here is from the middle of the sprocket which is on the right hand side to about four you see about four inches there to the front face of the motor mounting plate this is right under the tracks this is right. This is what you see on the left-hand side is the motor. The round part is the motor. Uh, the front face of the motor mounting plate is four inches from the midpoint of the sprocket. If you can get that. So this is as far as exactly how the tracks mount on the motor. That's that. Uh, this is the other side of the quick attach sticking out once again about one and a half to one and three quarters. Uh, here's the bar. So this is looking in between the two loader arms so that's that's the two inch quarter in, quarter by two inch tube that we welded in between the two arm sets to bond the two arms together so that they go up together not like one goes up faster than the other so th these are the loader arms that's the bar in between them two by two inch steel okay next this is how the sprocket ended up looking so we we welded so this is a, once again a manually torched sprocket manually ground and then this is the welding there's a hub there's a the one and a quarter inch coupler there's that bolt that holds the sprocket from falling off so that's that's what you see there a washer and a bolt so that's the detail there uh, not much to show you. I mean the critical thing is how far on the shaft is that sprocket so the picture I showed you just before that that explained it okay the motor mount plate here what I'm seeing showing here is the six inches the plate that the motor face attaches to so that's a six inch wide half inch plate that is it's actually six by six inches it's a square plate but six inches is its dimension 
Um, here we have about two and seven three quarters for the distance between the front face of where the motor mounts to the very far back of the end of the motor. And the motor is basically right next to the loader arm, shaft, uh, the vertical for the loader arm. It's like right next to it. Next, um, what do we got here? Don't know. I'll come back to that one. Uh, five inches is the width, so that what you're looking at down at the tensioner. So you see the tensional one of the tensioner bolts or threaded rods. But the top part of the tensioner is five inches. That's exactly what it should be, about five inches. So it's straddling the four inch vertical arms with half inch of meat of half inch plates on each side. So it's five inches for the idler width. Um, 22 inches. What's 22 inches? 22 inches is the base plate of the base base part of the bucket. I think that's correct in, as in a CAD. And 40 inches is the length of the tube to which the loader arm main attachment occurs. That's a one quarter by two by two tube. It's exactly 40 inches long. In other words, one inch in from the tracks. You see the tracks below. Um, so that's the loader attachment tube. So we didn't do what we did in a CAD. In a CAD we had either like the rod or we considered like an angle, but it, it turned out most convenient was a tube and it was easiest to build. Um, so that's what we attached the main cylinder to. Okay. And here's another picture of what I showed before, and that is that distance from the middle of the sprocket, essentially the roller on the right-hand side. So this is the tracks. So from the roller to the left side where it's four inches, that's what I'm talking about, the distance from the fr at the front of the motor mounting plate. So I think I said four inches before. It's, it's about four inches. Okay, next. We added a hook, a utility hook, to the loader. An advanced feature. So that's just in the middle uh, for grabbing a chain in there. Okay. 1.5 inches as far as the front. So this is the motor right next to the tracks. 1.5 inches from the front face to the very front of that square part of that motor. So 1.5 inches there. Okay, 20, about 26 inches, what is this dimension? 20, about 26 inches from the inside to the inside of the loader arms. So the in-between space between the loader arms, between the interface of the loader arms, almost 26 inches there. And more, more details on the motor. So once again, from the front face of the motor, that square part of the motor on the right-hand side, about four inches it's also about it's a little over four inches or so to the vertical arm support uh, so these are I mean these are tiny details so as you see here there's that bar the, the supporting bar in the bottom of this picture that's welded in between the two loader arms that's where I saw that showed the 26 inch dimension and below that is this other part which is the where the loader arm is attached to that and what I'm showing there is about three inches, a little, uh, little under three for the space of the loader arm from the power cube. So that's what you're seeing there is the power cube and then a spacing to the loader arm. So there's uh, almost, what is that? Is that showing like two and a half or kind of have to study that tape there. It's, it's under three inches for the spacing. Yeah, so it's two, yeah, other side shows about two, that, that shows it more clearly. It's more like two and a quarter. Uh, well, that's the other side, so it might be a little different. I mean, slightly non-symmetric, but two and a quarter about for the space from the power cube to the loader arm. Uh, and what is this? 34 inches or 34 and a half inches from the outside to the outside of the loader arms. So... The width, overall width of the loader arms is 34 and a half. 
what is this? That's just showing some of the details, the pin mounting. I mean, basically, this is all like similar to the CAD with the, just showing the detail where the tracks end up being, and they're pretty much level with the front face of the tractor. Uh, so this is looking at the front of the tractor by the loader arms. The, the track ends up being right even with that. Okay, and here's more details. Now from the inside face of that motor mounting plate, once again to the loader arm support vertical, about two and a quarter in this picture. So I'm trying to take multiple angles of that. Uh, that little lip, there's a little lip on the top of the bucket, and it's about half an inch. There's uh, the way the plates, we cut them or welded them together, we ended up having a little bit stick out from the top of the um, top of the bucket. Uh, what is this here? So this is this, um, what are we doing? From the bottom, so this is the frame looking from the back of the tractor. You see how the, the tensioner is totally different than what's in the CAD. But we actually ended up, so, so we tried first by putting the nuts on the underside of this tensioner. It was so hard to tighten them through this hole because you can only move the wrench so far. So we moved the nuts to the bottom. In order to move them to the bottom, we put a plate, little plates on the bottom so that the nuts are, are pulling from the bottom and it's easy to get a wrench in there. And what I'm showing here is also the six inch difference distance as far as after tensioning occurs, the tensioner is six, the bottom part of the tensioner is six inches from uh, the frame, the horizontals of the frame. So that's the frame here, the verticals at it. Oh, okay, here you see a big, big deal here. Uh, the arms, the arm supports are not over the frame because the motors were too wide, so we had to move them in about 1.5 inches. So this is what you're seeing here too. So the CAD has to be updated to reflect that. We had to move the verticals in. So that was that was one of the major, major messes in the whole build. I mean, we, we built it, we found the motors didn't fit, we had to cut them off, torch them, and re-weld them. So you see the mess that it looks like here. Um, but they're welded in about 1.5 inches in from the outside edge of the frame. So that's what you're seeing. And then 6 inches is for the full tensioning height of the, uh, of the tensioner. So that's, that's series number one. Let's go to the next. Um, next one, next set. Here's just two pictures, but yeah. Uh, here's the inside dimension of the, you see clearly here that these are the cylinder mounts on the arms. They're about three and a half inches, the inner space, uh, as far as the two plates of the loader arms, three and a half inches is what we ended up with. And here what I'm showing is uh, the width. So this is a detail of the arm hanging on the arm shaft. And what we did was just take a one inch, dia uh, one inch wide, three inch inner diameter bushing. So what I'm showing here is that one inch, about one inch dimension. So that's what we put on the inside. This is uh, what you see in the very center is the half inch meat of one of the loader arms. So, uh, I think this is somewhat confusing here, but basically we use this bushing, two small bushings that are one inch wide underneath each of the loader arm um, pieces of metal. Okay, continuing. Here's the next, next set. Okay, let's talk about the attachment of the cylinders. So what we did here was a piece of six by six inch steel. So a square six by six inch cut in half and then the top tip cut off. What I'm showing here is the bolt uh, on both of the, the cylinder attachments is 3.5 inches above the level of the arm. So that's, that's the deal. And this, this triangular piece is basically a square that's cut in half and the square is made from half inch by six by six. So that's that. Um, what are we showing here? I'm showing here the six inch length these are the, that's the tooth bar. What we used is one inch, one inch rebar that's six inches long. Uh, so here I'm reflecting like the six inch length from the, the back to the front of the rebar to which the tooth bar is mounted. So six inch long piece of one inch rebar is what we used. Uh, the height of the tensioner is five inches for that front. When you're looking from behind the tractor at the tractor, as you're the operator, so you're seeing five inches. That's half inch by five inch. That's a half inch by five inch bar. 
Uh, the bar, this is the bar that actually mounts the motor, and that's a four, four inch wide. And the other dimension of it, I'll show you that later, but it's half inch thick by four inches. That's what mounts the front, the, that, the motor mount plate. Okay. Uh, here is showing another dimension. It's about four inches. Um, let's see, here we're showing three, uh, one, two, three. What are we showing there? Is once again a dem no? This is this is the on the Bobcat male. The tabs are about three point. Is that um, what are we showing there? Three point five or so. I believe it's three point five. So in other words, the two point five inner space for the mounting of the the curl cylinder there, and. What I want to note is that this left tab is exactly on the edge of the, the Bobcat male. Okay, here's the actual tensioner support bushings. They're three inches wide. And that's half inch thick steel. That's the precise bushing material, three inches long, you can say. And you see the nut welded to the bottom of that. Um, as far as uh, the tooth bar here, I'm skipping around here, but that's the order of the pictures. It's a four inch wide plate that's half inch, half inch by four inch plate on the whole bottom so that the tooth bar is removable with the different the bolts there. It's half by four. What is this? The spacing between the teeth here is about 6.5 inches for the two outside teeth. And, and it's actually different for the inner teeth. We, we kind of messed up the tooth bar, the spacing wasn't correct. Uh, but here you see the attachment, what I'm showing in this picture is that the attachment of the outer tab, and the tab should be exactly as in a CAD, the outer tab is right on the edge of the male bobcat. So that's the point here. And it has to be finished well, it's still, it's still somewhat tacked in. Um, tooth bar, 4 inch length on the cutting tooth, and that's quarter inch steel. This is once again a detail of the mounting of the main loader arm cylinder. So that's the quarter by two by two tube that I mentioned. It's two inch tube, and it the way it's the cylinder attaches is through a one inch piece of bushing that's welded to the front, or to, you can say to the back of this bar. It's an easy way to do it. Uh, just you know, two pieces, one one little tube here that's cut to the inside dimension of the tabs tangs here one inch pin continuing uh, okay so this is the motor plate that attaches to the idler that sorry the tensioner so that piece of metal is half inch by five inches long so remember in the other picture I showed it's one and a half it's one half by four inches tall and one half by five inches long and the motor is on the left hand side here the, the square part of the motor is here so if you can picture that that's motor mounting bolt one of the four Okay, continuing. So once again, another detail of what the distance looks like. So I'm showing here six inches to the top. I don't know why I'm showing. Uh, I don't know what I'm showing here, because what what it should be is that one to three point five inches to the middle of the bolt from the the bottom. Uh, I'm not really sure what I'm showing there. Okay, the width of the tooth bars two inches for the front cutting edge here's another picture so this is what we ended up doing like when when we do that bushing into the vertical arm support that's what we did uh, because that bushing is so wide you, you literally have to cut off the the vertical it doesn't you can't like torch a hole in it it you have to cut it off essentially so that's what we did and then um, cut out like a semicircle in it but it should be the center of it should be at the the Four inches above the the last hole because it should be I believe in the middle like the center should be through the center of where the hole was I think but we we got it as high as in a CAD except we had to cut off the the vertical arm arm support okay that's the tooth bar what, what I'm showing you is that the distance between the outer teeth and the remaining ones is a little larger uh, that's because um, uh, the tooth bar was done where the tooth was not all the way at the edge. It has to be all the way at the edge. So 
and then we ended up with a space we ended up cutting it and re redoing a part of it but you definitely want a tooth on the outside so that you're getting the full width of the bucket otherwise the tractor can't follow your bucket because the cut part is too narrow so tooth bar on the outside the teeth on on the outside edge are critical okay uh, what is this here nine and a half inches for the distance of this is so nine and a half inches is the fit the width of the male bobcat quick attach so that's what we're showing here I'm trying to measure get a measurement of the bobcat male part how wide exactly is that compared to what whatever we thought was like in the cat I know Roberto you picked the dimension for that what we're seeing is about nine and a half inches for the width of the bobcat male uh, that's the measured I don't know what it shows in a in the documentation um, so this is the collar okay it's it's also a little hard to see here this is the collar in between the two loader arm flats so because we have that those one inch bushings on either side of the basically the two pieces that make up the loader arm there's a one inch bushing but the space on the loader arm shaft is empty there so we can put a clamp there so instead of putting the clamp on the outside or inside we can put it right in the middle and that's very convenient actually we didn't plan on this but it was convenient since since we didn't use a full piece of tubing that em space was empty and we can put a clamp on it so it's a single bolt clamp two inches wide uh, so it's one of our clamps so we talked about like triple bolt clamps double bolt clamps single bolt clamps this is a single bolt clamp uh, made of the it's half inch thick metal okay next okay this is the spacing about two and a half inches of the tensioner from the side of the arms so it's about two and a half inches just for where that collar is on the shaft what I'm showing here is two and a half inches for the length of that cutoff piece on the lo mounting of the loader arms on both of those triangular pieces. They're identical, two and a half. So the bolt is the same height, three, three and a half inches above the where it welds to the arms for both the primary and secondary cylinders, for both the main arm cylinder and a curl cylinder. Okay, I think I'm repeating here, but that's nine and a half inches of, for the width of the I think that's a repeat that's the width of the male quick attach nine and a half uh, and here showing uh, it's blurry but it's one inch for that top piece it's that part of like I think it's called the breaker part but the, the bottom part was two inches wide the top part of the of the um, of the teeth is one inch wide as it should be in the CAD. Uh, spacing here is 4.5 inches between the narrower teeth, whereas remember it was 6.5 for the outer teeth. Uh, what do we show here? There's that metal plate mounted on the bottom of the tensioner so that we can put the nut on the bottom of the tensioner as I mentioned and that that piece of steel is half inch by four inches wide spanning the whole bottom of the uh, the tensioner and I think that's it. Uh, so that's pretty much all the different dimensions I've got. Let's see, um, I miss anything. I think that's it. That's all we got. So it's about 70, well, only about 50, 50 or so pictures that we showed here. So these are the, the various updates or changes that have to be made to the, the tractor. The main change, like as far as what we have, is the loader arms. And a critical change that wasted a lot of our time was that where the loader arms are mounted because of the space of the and the motors and the motors were a little thicker than we thought so we had to put the loader arms in 1.5 inches now is this acceptable for the next build i think so it's doable if we want to use the exact motors and keep the overall width of the tractor to exactly 42 inches right now the tractor is exactly 42 inches uh, wide so it's really good uh, so that's it. So with that, I mean, someone has to review that pretty carefully and make uh, make notes over that the last 25 minutes of explaining what all the changes are. But that's 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 what we ended up doing for as built. Any questions on that? Yeah, 
Martin, do yeah. you think it'd be helpful to to uh, document that with like some taking the old uh, old CAD and then you could just take some screenshots on pre CAD and Absolutely. show the measurements of the old one and the other one and the new one. Absolutely. Um, cool. Yeah, cool. would anyone uh, be interested? I think that might be a little bit more fun to do on a, a chat. It's a little it's just kinda grabbing some some uh, some thoughts and or some some screen chat uh, screen chats and and uh, um, it would be something we just sit down for an hour or something and, and uh, have like five people work on it and be done pretty quickly. Yeah, what we want to do is, I mean, uh, transcription of that, like basically, yeah, taking the screenshots and attaching screenshots, the words to the screenshots, because all I did here was go through the specific detail just to show what those pictures are. Uh, but yeah, someone would have to review that. Uh, so let's talk about some role division real quick and how, you know, what what is the scope of what everyone else is working on? So um, the robotic tractor, just, just to wrap up on that, the guys came over here, we, we, we got snagged. I mean, we, we almost could work the tractor, remote, you know, by remote control, but we didn't have, it turns out the Raspberry Pi has 3.5, 3.3 volt uh, signals and the part which connected, uh, converted that 3.3 3 to 5 so we can activate relays, that part just didn't work on our little circuit, so we were lost not being able to turn on our solenoids. So we decided actually to go straight to find different solenoids which are 3.3 volts not solenoids the the relays we our next step on that is to find 3.3 volt relays that can be activated directly with the raspberry pi for the robotic operating system tractor now as far as robotic operating system tractors um, we our conclusion on um, just just to update everybody We've got a simulated model. The guys are working on the hardware and the software using the robotic operating system, ROS. But thing there is, we decided that it's relatively easy for people to get remo involved remotely by basically logging into the system here so they can potentially control the, like once we get to testing and troubleshooting the tractor, of course in a safe environment, we can actually uh, have people log in to the Raspberry Pi that's controlling the the tractor uh, remotely so that remote collaborators can be involved. So that's kind of uh, pretty far out there, but the idea that that surfaced our minds was to our minds was, okay, then we can develop a remote CSA where you're actually remote controlling through the internet a tractor that does work on another site. I mean, that's what, where we're going here, which is pretty crazy and, and pretty exciting, uh, but the singularity is coming, so watch out. Okay. With that said, let's talk about role division, um, role division to see where everyone is, because we want to make sure we know what everyone is doing. So, uh, so if you guys wouldn't mind, um, can you, on that page number three, let's let's map out what everyone is doing. Uh, so I'm gonna do a, let me just set up this one template uh, box with the proper formatting, Ubuntu condensed centered no border okay so there let's let's see what um, everyone is doing because I think some people are not aware what, what some others are doing so so we got Steven um, I think what we could do is actually let's put names but also we well topics like what people are doing so let me maybe do um, so I'm gonna do this just do that and like clusters like for example Roberta's working on the Chile D3D what do we call that the the Chilean D3D. Then there's the Saudi Arabia D3D. It's kind of a cluster on the 3D printer stuff here. There's Ahmed there.
and I'm working on a 12 inch one so I'm actually I need to still ship out the 12 inch one to Canada from one one of the guys that did the workshop here so 12 inch d3d Twelve inch bed D three D. Um Okay, what's Abe doing? Abe, still there? Yes. Um, I was looking over some of the micro track stuff, but most of the work I got done was on the, the live track, just with the cab. Yep. A little bit. I had some ideas for that. Uh, I just uploaded some of that today, too. Oh, excellent. I want to take a look at that. Yeah. So, live track. What else is going on? Let's see. Microtrack documentation cleanup. GPS. Um, I still have to do the trencher for the. Uh, we got to bury that power line here. Uh, that's got to happen before the mice chew it up <laughs> and we have to redo it so trencher uh, there's actually going to be more testing of the of the micro track there's uh, on a seed eco home turns out our our uh, drainage system failed in the sense that it turns out when you examine the landscape, there's about about an acre of runoff going into our drainage, so it's overflowing. So we're gonna have to do some more uh, more drainage ditching around it. And I'm gonna try to do that with the micro track. So there's both trenching and um, additional trencher work, probably backhoe, like more like backhoe style. Um, Wait, what happened there? Uh, 
Uh, and what I'm doing here is um, I'm going to post some more work, but I'm doing a hydronic stove on a seed eco home right now, too. And we're basically finishing up the install. Lots of leaks to deal with because we used some pieces that were old. I'm working on that right now, too. Hydronic stove. <clears throat> so I'm going to finish that today. I'll throw up some pictures and videos. But yeah, um, let's see. Does this kind of cover what's happening in the team? Let's let's look at the team roster. Who else is uh... so Lex? Where are you? Where are you, Lex? Yeah, it got deleted. The uh, there was some there was Lex and Oliver was on there. Shit. Uh, working on the OS and Dev workbench and it got. Okay, let me uh, let me uh. No, I can add it back in. Here, I got all of I was trying to make room because Stephen. Oh, okay, there it goes. Oh, there it is. That was me. So, and then. I, I had moved it here because Stephen. Uh, oh. Stephen is one of the people who did the other work. Oh, okay. That's why I moved it down. Okay, go down ahead. There. Sorry. Um. Yeah, let's clean it up there, and then, then shop aid. That's, you know, in the background. Or do we put it on here or not even? No, let's put it on. That's I think that's pretty important. So documentation related. And let's see. Let's see who are some of the missing people on the roster. Um Stephen, Abe, Ahmed, Alejandro, Christian, Christian. Oh, forgot about Herman, uh, who's working on uh, Australia D3D. He's working on that. So, Herman. How do you say it, Germain or Herman or? Um, and the circuit mill, I mean, that stuff is happening in the background, uh, opencircuitinstitute.org, that's piping up, but Shane is kind of still working on it, not ready for deployment yet, but that circuit mill, all that around that is coming together. Um, oh, Martin, do you know what happened with uh, Michael? Because I know I helped him uh, with the uh, uh, WebGL stuff, and then uh, I guess he was sick for a while. I don't know if he's still sick. Or... Right. Uh, Michelle, you're talking about? Yeah, Michelle. No, I haven't. I don't know. He He got busy for a little bit. He might be putting a roof over his head right now but I don't know you gotta check in with him okay. see where he's at um, so see I just want to do CNC circuit mill so Shane See, uh, yeah, I want to see. Does anyone know where Oliver is on the D3D workbench? Um, I know that in his log he posted that he, he tried it and he had some issues with it and he emailed Steven uh, to find out how to resolve the issues. That mm -hmm. he had. Yeah. Um, hey, what about Dixon? We have things on Minifrance. Dixon, pipe up. I think he he just left. Oh, he uh, did. So. 
He was having troubles with Jitsi. Okay. The Lyman extruder. So that, you know, I just need to put a couple of days in there. So basically right now it's time to like wrap up all the loose ends, but Lyman extruder, I just got to put like a day or two into that to finish that and spit out some filament. Um, And then the other thing, the tech for trade guys, that I'm talking to them on Thursday. Um, see if we could get that technology transferred, documented. Uh, see if they can actually join our team in some way to document it fully. We're going to talk about how do they get it out there and how to document it properly. Um, there's So it's the tech for trade PET extruder. Um, Michelle on WebGL, I think that's, that's related to documentation, which we should put here. So WebGL stuff. So I'm Sarah, Oliver, Michelle, Michael, Martin, Josh. Israel, Herman, Dixon, Christian. And Christian, Christian's doing some. What's Christian doing? Latest was. Do, does anyone know what Christian is doing? Is he helping out on the. I mean, there's the, jit, the whole Jitsi video bridge thing. Uh, that's Michael. That's in progress. I guess some getting close to that on our own server. So this is the documentation cluster. We've got a OSC Linux that people should download and try. Okay. Using, right? Yeah. Yeah, we're, yeah, and uh, the thing about, since talking to the robot operating system guys, because we're doing the GPS micro track with Ross, we can start studying that a little bit, but actually we want to add Ross to our distribution if we're going to be using it. Uh, it seems like a major step up, but talking to those guys, it appears that Thing, things like the robotic arm, the tractor, including simulations of the brick press, those can be done in, done in robotic operating system. They have that simulator there. So, for example, we could put in the, the brick press, and based on a code that we give it, it could simulate how this brick press is going to be pressing bricks, which is, which is actually important for some refinement work. Like, if you want to do optimization of brick pressing rate, you can do that. So, uh, I think we want to add... Ross to the OSC Linux distro. Uh, I'll talk to, we'll, we'll keep talking about that. I want to invite Matt to present to us on uh, on the robotic operating system, just so people get familiar with what it can do. Um, I think it's pretty complicated right now, but it can be made much more easy and accessible to people, like when you have libraries for it. So we can start generating libraries. Um, let's see. Um, let's see Linux. Christian is um, yeah. I think that kind of covers where we're mostly at. But there's a whole cluster of activity around the printer, a cl whole cluster around the tractor, and so forth. So that is good. Let's see. Um, on the Roberto, are you still there? Can we maybe talk just a second? So can we have you focus on the 
the replicating the extruder part, so upgrading the extruder. So that's that's on your mind. Uh, yes, I, I can do that, but I I have to wait for the relay mm -hmm. first. How long is that gonna take? Or maybe I'm not sure. Maybe fifteen days. Okay, so by that time you can you know build it all and get it. You know you can do. I mean you can actually do everything minus. Uh, heated bed activity so you can test everything and make sure everything is working um, yeah and let's see do I think they even print without without a heated bed if you put I think if you put tape on a bed you can print without a heated surface so I mean I don't know if you want to get into that but uh, they do print PLA without a heated surface as well so that might be an option I'm not sure you want to go there but you could Okay. Um, in the meantime, so so is that going to be Roberto? Do you have time to keep keep on the the tractor work, the big tractor, or because like, you were doing that before? Yes. Okay. So. Yes, I can. Okay. So if you have time that you're not doing on a printer, then continue with Abe, like we were doing on a big tractor, refining some of that geometry there. Uh, my goal is by uh, probably by like January or so I want to put a schedule fill the schedule for next year like literally for every month and we can do that right now um, I know we have two brick press production runs already and I, I got feedback that from some people that if you want people to show up give them six months when you announce a big workshop so I really want to try to put the whole schedule up on for next year like as soon as we can just to have that predictable schedule and um, the way it's looking like for the big tractor I mean I probably build the big tractor like in March uh, April April March March we're looking tentatively at a Costa Rican date for for brick press and possibly tractor micro track uh, April might be a decent time for the big tractor I mean, we got gotta just keep going, and then throw in a sprinkle of of uh, 3D printer workshops. But as soon as we work out the the new extruder, I'd like to hit the 3D printer workshops again, and with the probably the 12 inch version, probably offering both the 12 inch and 8 inch version. But I mean, I think that that workshop there is ready ready to go. So so that would be good. Uh, just some other notes on how we can involve other projects like if you guys if anyone sees any people f with related projects such as robotic arms or or drones for cam like drones like for cameras or uh, as a 3d printed product uh, we want to involve somebody from the drones community and like the robotic arms because we do have the robotic arm on the roster of 50 technologies the other part on a uh, production tools so so welding arm for you know robotic welding arm then there's the MIG welder which there's a person gonna be joining the team pretty soon but we're gonna do the the MIG welder he's gonna be tasked with that uh, an open source version of that which would be a very exciting thing because as I mentioned the welders are uh, uh, a problematic thing for us so I'm gonna put the welder here and that is um, the person who's joined supposed supposed to join the team pretty soon uh, pending their test um, so just so everyone is aware of that okay um, okay Roberto Ahmed's in the background so Abe do you have um, do you have a, a plan for what you can do Um, yeah, I guess I may have some questions. Um, I, mm -hmm. I'm working on the, the big tractor right now. Yep. Just trying to figure out how to do that cab. I started doing a two by two tubing design, which, yep. uh, it gives a little more space, but I'm trying to figure out how to make it a little stronger with some reinforcement plates. And, uh, it looks like it needs some other supports underneath the cab on the mainframe and things like that. Mm-hmm. Okay. But I, I followed, um, been trying to follow some of the stuff Roberto showed me for uh, ease of updating and editing in this, and so I've just added a, a, another cab in there. Okay. Uh, so then let's um, 
Yeah, actually, so Abe, let's let's do that a little bit. I just want to ask, um, let's let's sit down and actually look at that for a sec. But but I want to ask Josh, are you pretty clear on what you can do for the documentation of the micro track and cleanup? Yeah, and there's um, you know from being at the workshop there, there's there's quite a few things that I um, I can see to you know clean up, especially that tensioner mechanism. You yep. know, we had like all those parts welded up together. And yeah. So I think that's going to be a good portion of my my work as well as the documentation. And those yeah. things go hand in hand. Yeah, definitely, definitely. There's a lot of work there. What we want to do there is to document exactly what we have, because what we have it's a little messy, but I mean I, it's. Pending some works. minor, yeah, it works. It works really well. So pending some further testing, I think it's worth documenting because if someone wants to replicate exactly that, I mean, it works and it's pretty solid at this point. So uh, it's it's definitely worthwhile to document it, and then we can go from that as 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 far as making new updates to that. So it'd be good to update what we yeah. have. Mm -hmm. And uh, as far as the format you're looking for, that is that you're thinking just like a. Oh, no page or do we want a separate google doc or we have so what we should do is for for all the cat updates i mean we should definitely do a google doc for all the cat updates and then we have the we should have the micro track version 17.10 page on the wiki which we do so so under micro track v17.10 um, yeah that's just basically a skeleton page it only has like the the bill of materials but there's also there's a link there tractor construction set 2017 that's where we did most of the work for the the micro track so you can borrow from there and, and kind of maybe uh, steward the micro track version 17.10 page definitely add your CAD updates document in there so start a Google Doc and do that like what you mentioned about the cut and paste of all the pictures and putting words to that to as far as all the details that want to be updated and we just work through those one by one it's also it's also a task that if uh, anyone else can uh, help contribute to that if they join the team there's one guy who came to one of our workshops who was interested in doing a tractor micro track development so maybe we could task out some of that as well possibly if he if he makes it on a team pretty soon but that would be micro track version 17.10 page would be the place I just pasted the link in the, in the chat box there. Yep. Okay. So is that, uh, any more questions on that, Josh, or? Um, yeah, I think it'll, you know, using that, uh, trying to keep as much stuff on the wiki accessible and then in the Google Doc. Um, and uh, yeah, just working on some of the, the current version, what we've got there, and uh, everyone what we ended up doing and mm -hmm. what we got and then uh, um, yeah and then start working on some of the changes that kind of uh, you know mapping out those those ideas we have for maybe some you know like quick improvements like, yeah it, yeah it's not a lot of significant changes you know it's, it's just like some um, you know tuning up some geometry and figuring out how to solve that motor problem we had because mm -hmm. I like the motors that you're able to mention it it just they just didn't fit in very well, so we kind of got right. to think through that a little bit. Yeah, but first, yeah. so yeah, step at a time. So step one is to document exactly what we have, and then step two yeah. would be to go from there. But yeah, you don't have to worry about the yeah. second step yet, because uh, we want to make sure we document all that we have so far. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, so let's take a look at the big life track for a second, and... and um, Abe, so go ahead. What, what? Go ahead on that. Yeah, let's see. I've shared my screen. Yep. Got I'm, it. I'm working on it. I, I uploaded something, but I got ahead. I need to change some stuff I did there. Um, yep. Just trying to do this two by two frame, and I'm trying to add some plates. I can see here or something like that to maybe reinforce this without adding a lot of visual blockage. Uh huh. It's obviously. Being out of there is good too, and I know, like you said, that four by four is a lot better yeah. for taking hits from trees. But yeah. I figure we should be able to to reinforce it enough. Yeah. And I don't know, maybe some angle bracing. But I, and I see, I was going to look at the materials more because 
Uh, I know obviously like to recycle a lot of parts, and I don't know how much there will be on, on this tractor of that, but um, and mm-hmm. I'm trying to figure out what materials would be cheaper. Obviously, the two by tubing is probably a lot cheaper than the four inch. So right, uh, probably use quite a bit more of it and and still be cheaper, right? Yeah, so, I mean, if you use quite a bit, definitely. Animals. Yeah. Yeah, it, well, I'm not sure there might be part of the frame could use some four inch. We could mix mix it up technically. Well, I mean, um, leave leave all the frame in the four inch. I mean, we're because that's a good universal well, strong system. And then the, the base frame. Yeah. But yep. the, the cab. Right, the I cab. Mean, the, the cab would be the two inch. And yes. Yes. I, well, I was trying to decide whether it would be good to have four inch on part of it but i mean the main the main points on the cab are going to be like the sides and the front because those would get hit by by a tree i mean yeah the top is uh, is the most critical part yeah like what you drew there with that reinforcement that's a good that's a good uh start um or it could be just triangulated braces there too something like that um yeah some 45s yeah um, I mean, a top. Yeah, I mean, a top could be something like quarter-inch plate. We can we can do that, uh, so you make sure you don't get nothing goes in through the you top. You need to be able to see. You need to be able to see out of the top, but I don't know if you'd want to put like a plate maybe at the back. Yeah. Uh, that might you know half of it could get plate behind there, and then mm-hmm. I don't know about mesh or something in the front, but you know. Right. There's probably different things that could strengthen it. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, yeah, I would say probably the sides would want to be... It depends where we, where we mount the the valves, but the valves are probably going to be mounted on both sides, one side and the other side, so you can get in from the front. Um, but probably like... Yeah. Uh, top, I would like to have solid as much as possible for... I mean, also for rain protection. And... Uh, probably mesh on the sides on the two sides or three sides so we can kind of start with that and the front would be open as much as possible so we can get in and out um, so it looks like the the basic the basics of the width we have that addressed as far as the being able to connect the arms to the to the bobcat quick attach now what you have then is is correct as far as being able to attach to the quick attach without a problem, right? It's let's see. Um, the arms, I think, pretty much left it like it was. I think there needs a little more gap in the arms. So, depending on how the cylinders, uh, there's some flexibility. I think some space. There's a certain amount of room for things to move around there. Because um, I think, well. I was wondering about the front cylinders too. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know, if, you know, how final we are on the arm design. Right, right. Uh, and, and I thought on the micro track too, it seemed like the one of the things that changed on the micro track might have been the the cylinder length wasn't quite the same. Or mm-hmm. you know, I don't know if we had the cat exact on the cylinders. Right on the micro track the bill of material should have the correct cylinders like because it shows their closed closed distance and then when you add the stroke it shows their extended distance so it should be correct within the bom i know that the discrepancy was we we started with different cylinders and we ended up changing them so but as far as what's in the bom right now should be correct for the lengths of the cylinders yeah, yeah. Okay. So we'll go back to and, the bomb and look for the center to center length. I guess that's. What's well, well, for the big tractor, uh, those are. We'd have to dig to the former versions of like this was what the live track what 2012 or 2013 versions that these cylinders came from for specifically what they were. Uh, we've got those on hand. Those were 36 and 20, right? It was 36 inch and 24 inch cylinders we can go back to the drawing board or to the BOMs from from the old machines to see exactly what they are 
but we can also just look at currently, okay, what's available at surplus center for those types of cylinders and just work from those. But we got to make a decision somewhere. So either uh, probably, well, because we have those on hand, they're, they're good. We, we should start by looking at what they were in Lifetrack Genealogy and see if we can just... Uh, Okay, so, two. yeah, I thought you had the 36-inch ones on hand, at least, and I wasn't yeah. sure if those had been modified. I know no, you no, they weren't. The ends different, maybe? No, not at all. So I think Lifetrack okay. 4 is the comparison. So the, BO yes, those are the cylinders. The Lifetrack 4, okay. um, let's see if we can pull off a BOM for Lifetrack 4. Um... There was Bill a materials. list. Let's see on one of those. It didn't. It didn't look accurate. Arms. It was just listed in the wiki, but I can't remember which life track that was. Was it? Yeah, somewhere we have to. I'm looking at life track four, and I'm not seeing a BOM there. Let's see, maybe. Yeah. I mean, see if you can find it. Maybe. Um, let's see. Yeah. Let's see life track three. Did that have the same cylinders? Yeah, it looks like the cylinder. Mm, let's see. I know. Okay, the 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 main cylinders are the same. The the curl cylinders are different. So the we can at least get the BOM from Life Track Three. Let's see. Um. So I'm looking at that. Yeah, I still see. There may be some things to change on these cylinders on the current Life Track CAD. Um, I think the large cylinders kind of just mounted down to a shaft that looks like it's currently like in the bottom of the boat. Pretty sure that actually does need to be changed somehow. That I don't know how we, there's probably a way to do that, but it's kind of odd the way it is right now. And yeah, I figure on this large, on the bigger tractor, the arms, I assume with these big arms like this, you're going to want to box those in. Tom, maybe some on the bottoms to yeah. strengthen those a bit more. Yeah, I mean, so, we're using... And, and I, I think, think we should use solid tubing. Tubing? Yeah, Can probably. I mean, it's it's kind of tricky. Like, once they get so big, I mean, to hold them together. Like, on a micro track, it was easy enough because the arms were so, so small. It was kind of easy to work with them. But here, it's going to be kind of tricky. I would probably go with, uh, like... Uh, what we did before with this, t like put the tabs not mounted inside, but maybe like on a back or front, because it's it's just so much harder to work with. Um, yeah, I would probably probably do what we did before. Now for the the tight geometry of the the front part, the the bottom the, like the downward sloping part of the arms. Um, I mean, it's useful to have custom profiles, but we can do a, what I would suggest is doing similar to what we did before, which was, I think it was three by six square tubing, rectangular tubing, and that worked pretty well uh, for the strength, but we're, we just end up with these more blocky looking arms, like in Life Track. let's see, let's see what it looks like in Life Track 4, um, it looks, let's see, if you look at... Uh, it would be be comparable to life the way it looked in Life Track Four. Now, how does that look? So Not too bad. Is that I guess that I mean, look at it. tubing is easier yeah. than having to cut the arms. Of course. Oh yeah, it's easier. Had the table working. Would well, you it's... want to do it the other way? Because um, I assume I would... the material is expensive than it is to actually. And then yeah. Welded in the workshop. There's right? two. Yeah. There's two two camps of thought on that. If we want, if we've got, okay. Let first of all, let's assume CNC torch cutting. Um, and the second, the second part is, is it actually easy? Which is easier to do? Because if you do the the tubing, you still have to cut it. You have to still cut it at a particular angle, and weld in the the tangs and so forth. Here, you can do. You can cut CNC this, both the sides and the tops and bottoms of these arms, so you can then just weld them together as you need. So it would be actually quite attractive to do that. 
because then you're not re restricted by the three by six inch geometry of the the tubes so and then we can yeah. and then you don't have to worry about the mounting plates the tanks because they'll be all built into the arms so that would be actually yeah i probably take that back yeah we want to do it like we're doing here uh, but then weld it up like make sure you weld it up on the table you know so you get the solidness of these you don't want to be working with like four pieces that you're that are all loose you want to weld up one arm and the other arm and then start fitting it to the tractor um, something like that and also make it yeah. not super super heavy that we can't lift it like with reasonably like with one or two people because uh, they're gonna get heavy um, yeah they yeah. do look heavy and it looks like they their geometry is such that they need to be cut in out of a sheet yeah uh, more than one sheet because they're gonna have to be welded in two pieces mm. to join at some point it looks like let's um, see are we over just, can i jump in really quick and, yeah uh just on working on the micro track um on those those loader arms if we can like if there are some weird angles on there that like there was some that were it was really difficult to like lay out and measure um one of the pieces one of the pieces was just like a five inch flat uh, five yeah. inch by one half inch like long piece yeah and that was really easy to cut at one point and then the, the the problem after that was then this like weird angle and it was like you had yeah. multiple angles on that piece and so i think if if it like we can just keep that in mind like it's probably easier to have a single section um or like a kind of maintain a similar cross sectional area as you're going down that arm like you see how it, it kind of expands at one point and then it kind of goes back down and shrinks it just if you don't have a dnc uh which you know like we can we can kind of plan on having it and that would be really nice um but it doesn't take much extra for us to to you know plan for people that might not have that mm -hmm. i'm just going to cut yeah. my, what i my... was thinking was that it, it's good to, to maybe do some symmetrical things where there's tricks to draw it by hand using strands on in a workshop, even if you don't have a, uh, a CNC. So that's kind of complicated, but it would be like elliptical, you know, shapes that have symmetry and so on. Yeah. Which yeah. I was. And I mean, you can also so just draw like if you just got points to pull, right? And then you just have like, oh, I have a straight line between these points and this mm -hmm. angle. If, yeah. if it's really simple stuff like that, it's it's pretty easy to lay out and yeah. just like stick a big bar and then just take a torch and just torch off the whole edge, you know, yourself. And then you just grind it down really easily. Yeah. But if, if you have like really complicated angle, then you're also like, you're, you know, it's difficult to get multiple loader arms to have the perfect match. You know, you're, you're trying to line those, those two center points. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's just, um, trying to have as, as like as few of those like s slightly diverging edges as possible i think would be a nice thing like it'd be better just yeah. to make it big and continuous than it is to have it kind of expand and that was something i didn't expect or think of but just from that manual cutting was something that would make it a lot easier and quicker for um people if they don't have a cnc yeah so straight straight lines are not slight angles and not complex curves yeah yeah i wanted to say something yeah um when designing the the arms i, I realized that um, on the the um, the shape of the arm uh, it's not really re relevant what matters is the position of the holes right so exactly you know the the right position for the holes for the cylinders and for the shaft and etc you can give the arm the shape any shape that you want yep yep yeah exactly and just make that shape as simple as possible yep yep um and yep if we have the cnc the other thing is with these parts that are heavier if it's strong enough technically you can cut smaller parts out of some of these larger pieces uh like um you know at different points in some of these plates that are really large and probably unnecessarily heavy and strong a bunch of other parts could be nested in those and ideally we'll obviously get all that working but uh if you have enough 
strength and like those arms are going to be boxed in a lot then technically there could be more holes and parts of them that would make them lighter plus it would reuse uh steel plate more efficiently yeah hey guys i actually got to go right now to the bank before it closes so i gotta cut out but feel free to to uh continue that i'm still recording it all right but i gotta go like right now unfortunately so okay. but yeah yeah keep going cylinders i think marching mission before moving those to the front and i think if those arms are boxed in then that that would be okay i mean it's not that hard to make like a, a clevis on the front of the arms or wherever you won't attach the clevis of the cylinder so i, I think running on the front isn't a bad idea it doesn't look like it changes the angle of those that much and that corner there is probably a good place to have you know the steel box in more with plate on the front i'm thinking that would be a good idea and i i'm not sure about let's see these cylinders at the bottom i think we have an issue down there where that current shaft is and I guess, let's see, am I something hidden here? Oh, on my screen, I think part of the, uh, the cab is hidden. Well, a part of the frame. Had some other frame parts down there. Actually, there was another uh, piece of framing material or something welded in inside underneath the cab. It would give a, uh, a mount point for those cylinders, and maybe that shaft could still be eliminated. But I'm not sure the best way to do that. Uh, it well. I had a whole bunch more four, four inch tubing down there. But it looks like the cab, I assume that the cab should be somewhat modular. I mean, it should be welded together as a single unit for strength, but um, you might want to actually bolt it to the frame so that it, it can be removed as a unit instead of welded directly to the frame maybe yeah um one of the the things i was just looking at is you know we were talking about how the you know that we want to move the loader arms to the outside of that mounting like vertical bar um that and, uh that we wanted to move the the loader arms to like the outside edge so that you can put them on after you put that that shaft through the, the loader arms versus having to have them on the inside um, i think that I was that. discussed and i thought that the idea was we kind of leave the arms uh in line with the existing bucket design i mean it's not necessary but i think i think that's what was kind of decided there i yeah. I mean, there, there's ways to I, I did make a, um, I drew up a uh, extensions, the male quick attack legs, and that stuff, so that they could be 48 inches, but it it makes the, it, we'd have to rearrange the frame, it makes it kind of complicated, I think. Okay, yeah. Uh, I, yeah. I mean, I, and, and there's enough space, I think, for the cab with this design, I think that's what I did, because it was... It, it may have actually been weaker on certain things that way. Um, but I, I, it does look like we should be able to find... The main thing is we're going to wear the mount, the ends of the cylinders. And of course the cylinders hole could be moved and the arms and arm pattern can be changed. 
Um, or we could make let's see, something underneath where the cylinders could be attached and where they are. But that looks like that would require welding the more complex tubing down there. It looks like they're below the existing frame where they're mounted now to a to a shaft down there. And that's Roberto, are you still there? Yes, I'm here. Do you have, um, I guess you positioned that shaft down there. Um, I guess the easy way to solve this threat is maybe just move the cylinder. I mean, in the current arm design, if the cylinder was moved towards, or the cylinder mount point in the arm was moved forward, that way better. Of course, it also looks like you have to move the curl cylinders to the front of the arms to get that, to get those out of the way as well. I, I'm trying to see how many inches that would give, but uh, I mean, it's like it would be good just to mount those cylinders on something that's welded to the frame down there instead of like that shaft. Uh, but that might take a little bit more steel, maybe, maybe even just some two inch tubing uh, you weld it inside the edge of that frame. Actually, that it looks like we need some kind of tubing underneath the back of the cab as well. So something something's going to have to be added to the frame to support some of these things. Um, I uploaded an, another version for the live track on um, October 29, and there I used um, different cylinders. Uh, I used um, 30 and 14 inches cylinders. Um, well, I, I'm not sure if we have to to use the 30, 36 inches cylinder because it is um, I, I think it's difficult to to get a proper geometry for for the, the position of the cylinder and and cons considering that when the cylinder is, is extended um, the the right side arm have to to have a proper angle also so 
Uh, yeah. I think that's the main consideration for the position of the cylinder of the cylinder shaft. Okay, uh, I see those. Yeah, I saw the 30 and 14 inch cylinders. I, I guess we haven't been working with that one because the next one you uploaded was 36 and 16. So I guess that's just an optional uh, design there. I, I assume the reason um, March was sick with the 36 inches because they have those on hand. In fact, I'm pretty sure I saw one sitting in a bucket in the shop in the video. So uh, I guess that's why he wants to reuse those. They have them. They are a little long at 36. It, it seems excessive because yeah. you get a better angle if they're more vertical with 30 inches, maybe even less. I'm sure they have to be a large uh, diameter cylinder, but a third dick does seem long. Maybe we can um, move backwards the um, those vertical um, for the frame of the frame because the, I, I I remember that now the the power cubes uh, are going to be uh, smaller, so maybe oh. we, we we don't need that that much space for the power cubes. Uh, all that space. See, moving the vertical back. Uh, yeah. So the. All, all the, the the arms and the and the bucket, all, all all of those things, moving back together with the with those verticals, and maybe we can reshape the the arms so it's not going to to touch with the frame, with the front part of the frame. Yeah, I see that would make the arms longer. I guess. Um. Hey guys, one one thing to add on the power cube is that everything didn't fit in it, so the the dimensions that we used uh, is the power cube is going to be bigger than than what uh, we planned. I guess it's either going to be longer uh, to put uh, the fan and the radiator on the side, or it's going to be taller to fit the radiator on top in the original design. So just keep that in mind. Okay. okay yeah. So. Power well, actually, sure. hey, uh, sorry, uh, Lex, we talked about putting the fan, yeah, on the front, right, um, or the cooler up there, and, uh, like, that would be one of the options I think we were thinking about, just putting it in front of the air intake on the engine, um, but, yeah, I guess, and then we might be able to shrink it, keep it a similar size, but we'll see, so, yeah, I think you're right, leaving some extra space, though, is probably a good idea, because it would be really, really Um, yeah. If, uh, but what about the 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 new uh, uh, the small power cube? Because I I I remember that Martin said that we only need one big power cube and three the, the other three power cubes are going to be the small power cubes or or not? Yeah, I think that depends on the cooling because we had that uh, we have the. We got that bigger cooler so that we could run two power cubes. I think we were going to have two big, biggish power cubes and then two smaller ones without any of the cooler. Um, or, yeah, they they had a couple of maybe one other thing out of it too. Um, and that's for yeah. the life track mostly, probably because it it just has the one regular cube and then a small cube on the back, right? Um, uh, yeah, on the micro track. Um, yeah, we didn't need, we didn't end up building the small power cube yet, so we only had the yeah. one power cube. And of course, there was a bunch of stuff sticking out of it, which seems. I mean, yeah. I could have just bolted some more stuff onto the back of the micro track anyway, because it it seemed kind of front heavy. Yeah. With the big bucket um, anyway, but uh, we'll yeah. see. Uh, in, in those power cubes, is there still a problem with the? Let's see, the small engines that don't have uh, electric start, and you need to add a battery and things like that too, right? It's yeah, that was for running the cooler. Uh, there wasn't the enough. Um, yeah, the cooler fan. There wasn't enough 
power that you could pull from the alternator. So. Um, yeah, it just has a, some kind of electric. Uh, yeah, minor generation without an alternator. Yeah. Um, so, as understood, yeah, there has to be like one power cube that has all of that in it. Is what I think you're saying. There has to be one with a, at least one with a big fan and a battery, yeah. and so on. Yeah, and and it might not be a, a large battery. It might be a fairly small one. And there was a lot of space where you could fit a battery in pretty easily. Um, one of the reasons yeah. like you can really shrink the size is just because you had that engine with the uh, then that coupler with the then the pump on on the end of it, and you know that took up a lot of the space, but didn't really fill up a lot of the volume. Like a lot of the length was taken out from that, but. Yeah, probably just a motorcycle battery, and that might even be too large if, um, let's see, it was providing two amps, I think, on that one without the electric start, so. I don't, well, I don't know how much that fan was drawn, but yeah, it sounded like there's some issues with those power cubes, and they're, they end up being different, so. So I think the the battery wasn't uh, needed. I guess if if we're using the fan, the uh, the motor itself, the the air movement, like uh, Josh was saying, you know, just putting the radiator in front of the motor because, or the engine because the engine is generating uh, some air movement, uh, and it might be enough to cool it. So you might even not need uh, the battery, even though it's hot exhaust. Uh, well, no, no, not the exhaust. It's there's another part of it that's generating the the actual. Yeah, it's, um, it's in front of the air intake that that you would put the, the fan. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. And so then you get some flow, like it's actually sucking air through the cooler, right? And it's heating that preheating the the air that's going into the engine, but it doesn't really yeah. matter that much for efficiency needs versus making sure you're. Yeah. Nothing wrong with preheating your engine air so yeah i don't know how much heat the um the hydraulics produced i don't know i'm not familiar with that it, it seemed like it has a pretty there's a, a pretty large cooler on the hydraulic fluid res reservoir right it's yeah i don't know there the i guess the power cube they built out in utah um Everything fit in there fine with the cooler that was on. That that may be an issue. I don't know what the temperature range of that hydraulic fluid is. I can imagine in hot environments it might be more of an issue. Yeah, um, but you know that that cooler fit in there, the small cooler. I think the reason we had the reason we had a bigger cooler was uh, to be able to just have that one cooler run both of the power cubes and be able to cool enough of the, the oil. So, yeah. I, um, yeah. I guess some more detail on the power cubes for this one too, because I don't know if with this large tractor, I mean, this is, this is a big tractor. So, uh, but I assume that he wants to stick with the 16 horsepower small engine. So. Yeah. I mean, they're super like cheap and deal. power definitely what didn't seem to be an issue, right? Like we had to bypass a lot of the flow because the tractor oh. just like it just wants to go it's it was powerful yeah um, so it didn't yeah. seem like that was a big problem there uh so you know yeah i don't, I don't know what we're looking at for um for this next one but yeah the, yeah i'm not familiar enough i guess with the hydraulics how that uh how that all gets bypassed and and so on I mean, I know it, on the microcheck there was series parallel options and so on for speed, but obviously there, there's a lot of a torque with those hydraulic motors, so that's not an issue. Um, I, I figure it's mostly if you want to get speed, you need more flow. Yeah, I'm not. I'm definitely not an expert on that stuff either. Um, I was. Uh... It was, that was one of the cooler parts of the, the build is just learning a little bit more about how those hydraulics are working and why they're so cool yeah. and flexible. But yeah, um. yeah, I, I watched 
videos on this, but I don't know. So I guess, yeah, I, I don't know where. That's another question. I guess I hope it's. I'm gonna have to look at maybe some of the previous designs because so he was saying that the some of the controls in this cab should be mounted maybe sides. I, I would think at the front, but obviously if you're gonna climb in the front of this cab on this one, then you don't really want them right there in the way in the front. Uh, so maybe maybe on the sides because. I assume that a lot of the are the hydraulic controls on there. Elect, I mean, you, it's done electronically. Like, uh, there, are there buttons? Because I know I saw some of the other tractors. He has levers that are actuating. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that's the just a, like a mechanical valve. Um, yeah, yeah, a mechanical valve. So on the micro track, it was all uh, push button, though, right? options for electronically controlling the, the valves and then of course there's the radio control so i assume that's assume new just, as as i would not it, it wasn't like that when i was there um yeah. they had the mechanical valves and so that's what they just did okay okay so that's that was what they were i think doing. i did i think i did see that in the video i assume he hooked up the mechanical valves probably to test it yeah yeah the videos to get it going yeah, those mechanical valves are probably easier to use by hand for testing. Um, that's interesting. Okay, so, yeah, it looks like we're going to need more detail. Uh, just going to have to figure out some of the shape of the other parts. Maybe, maybe I should look for some of the old parts, uh, assuming they had those drawn up in CAD for, like, controls and, and figure out where all that goes because the let's see I guess that's just wires since since it's electronically controlled there's some wiring that goes in for the controls for the control panel uh, assuming he's not not going to want to use mechanical those mechanical valve controls which I see on the old tractor it has there too but I assume it's the, the advantage of the mechanic, the advantage of the mechanical ones is that you don't need a battery. So that's kind of the issue. The, the current micro track with the mechanical uh, valve, you can just use it whenever you know all you need is, is gas. Uh, but if you switch to the electric, electronic one, then you need a battery, which means you need to replace the battery when it drains, or you have to add an alternator to the uh, power cube. So that adds a lot of complexity. So I don't know if the goal is to have two like a really uh, crude micro tractor that does not have any electronics and then a fancier one that has an alternator and a battery and, and electronically controlled valves um, so yeah. and the, it, the expense yeah, and goes the, up significantly one, so it's one of the like, big reasons they replaced the, the uh, mechanical ones with the solenoids is so they could do the autonomous tractor part of it um, and then yeah. and the idea is that we have a solar power cube anyway um, so Electrical. Yeah, the solar cube is interesting. Um, I guess they could add a solar panel on top of any of these, or certainly on the big tractor. Tractor, of course. Uh, I think the exhaust on those power cubes is mostly upwards, though. So, of course, panels don't like heat either. But you know, it'll still work, I guess. But um, it, panels always turn generate a certain amount of light and of course if the thing is parked outside then it would charge a small battery and it would be okay that's an option i guess just put a small panel on your tractor or if you're you know if you're using the modular design you have maybe you'd have two or three of the the you know, like gas powered cubes and then you'd have a solar one you know um, yeah that would be i mean larger battery. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. There, there are electrical issues, obviously, uh, for the power cubes, especially since um, if you don't have the alternator, you don't buy that electric start motor. Of course, is, is there a, there's actually like a hundred dollars difference, I think, almost on the electric start versus the cheaper, the non-electric start, right? And I think I that's, mean, I think that's the major issue there. Is we need a solution for the power cubes to have a little bit more electrical.
which is either mounting an actual alternator uh, on a pulley somehow off of the shaft or uh, either the solar, I guess is another option. So, of course, actually, if the, each one of those motors is generating two amps of power, even though it doesn't have electric start, when you have four of them, if you wire them all together, that's um, several amps. So you, you just have to run all four of them to get enough power to run some things. But the Arduino controllers and so on, they, they take so little power, it's, it should be pretty negligible. Of course, you need a, an off switch, but that's not a big deal. Um, So, yeah, it, yeah, it, looks, like, it looks like it's about a $50 difference in the electric yeah. start yeah. engine, but I don't know if that actually has an, yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure that it has an alternator. Okay. Yeah, it may be with it's the $300 engine. dollars versus like 269 or something. Yeah, I mean, you could always buy one of those, but it seems like there should be should be ways to avoid that, maybe. <clears throat> it may complicate wiring and so on, though, and that, well, I mean, either way, there's lots of hoses and, and complications, even though they're modular. So. Hey guys, just FYI, we're we're past the two-hour mark. So. Yeah, I think I think we've kind of discussed. So, there's just some details they're gonna have to figure out. We'll go back and look at maybe some of the old stuff. And, and and Abe, are you on the Slack channel? You know, I haven't been on that. I hear you guys talking about that, but I haven't looked that up yet. Yes, yeah. the link's in the doc, and you can join that, and we can, if you got questions or something, just, like, yeah, okay. there, yeah. Let's see. at least until Lex uh, gets the other stuff going, which sounds like soon. Yeah, that chat looks interesting. I don't, it sounds like that, um, uh, let's see, it's going to be designed so that it's a relay chat. Or it, it, func it functions, uh, you can use it as a messaging system even if you're offline and then it synchronizes later, I think is what you guys were saying. Uh, no, you have to be online. I mean, I don't know if it makes sense to have chat that's uh, offline. Oh. Okay, so. I, I think maybe what, what was mentioned is that it, the way that the, uh, the file, the, the CAD model part would work is that uh, you would download it, and it would actually save the file, like the the models themselves, on your file system, so you could work on them uh, if you're offline, and then and then synchronize when you get back online. So that that was mostly for the editing of the cat, I think, not the chat, because yeah. it wouldn't make sense to use chat if you're offline. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it wouldn't. Uh, yeah, I mean, it would get the wiki for that much information. So yeah, um, yeah, that's nice. Uh, that workbench looks really good. That, is that only uh, is that being designed for the daily in particular, or are you just going to? Um, it's part of the. It's not part of the daily right now, is it? Or are you guys no, merging? I, I didn't with, get your question. Um, it, is it? You're designing it for the daily version of FreeCAD specifically, or set point seventeen, or is it going to be like compatible with point one six until that? Oh like yeah, it works. Control. It works with any version of FreeCAD. It doesn't have any actual dependencies on FreeCAD. It's just QT mostly. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. QT is the yeah that popular GUI design environment or uh, API. Yeah, I know what that is. So, yeah, that sounds nice. Yeah, we've actually I've actually tested both in 16 and 17, and it works. I mean, it doesn't it doesn't care what version you're using. Okay. 
Okay, so you guys want to uh, wrap up? Are there any other uh, uh, questions or that we can answer here? Let's see. Yeah. Okay. I think I'm going to uh, head out, guys. All righty. Well, it was nice talking to you all. Yeah. Nice to see you. See you, see you next time.